Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Ocean Expert Exchange. Scientists in every Florida school and Anjuri Foundation are super excited to be here again with you today to share our final spring series event. In this series, we dive into all things marine science in order to share what's happening in the field, as well as a lot of interesting careers related to marine science and more. And today, we're going to be talking with Dr. Catherine Galloway of Nichols State University all about lionfish. But first, we'd like to tell you a little bit about our programs. Scientist in Every Florida School is a free program housed within the Thompson Earth Systems Institute at the University of Florida. And the mission of CEFS is to engage K-12 classrooms and students in cutting edge research by providing science role models and experiences like today. And we hope that that inspires future stewards of our planet. And Jari Foundation is a nonprofit headquartered in West Palm Beach, Florida, and the foundation supports and promotes marine science research and education. Also, many of the foundation's primary initiatives involve its 65-foot research vessel, the RV and Jari. In case you missed it, uh, any of the information on the previous slides prior to uh, the start this afternoon, we'd like to remind you to leave questions for the scientists by typing them in the chat box, and we also will be providing a survey at the end of today's presentation for a chance to win some really cool swag. So we hope you'll take part in that. So at this time, I'd like to go ahead and introduce you to Dr. Catherine Galloway. She's going to tell us a little bit about who she is, what she does for work and why it's important. And so at this time, Dr. Galloway, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to you. All right, great. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. Um, let me just go ahead and share my um, my presentation really quick. All right, so a little bit about me before we get started. So I did my PhD in Florida where a lot of this research took place that I'll be presenting. Um, I actually grew up in California though, and I did my undergraduate degree in marine biology. So while a lot of um, people consider me a marine biologist, um, I'm really interested in the form and function of structures um, and the form and function of organisms in general and how organisms do the things that they do. So I really consider myself a biomechanist um, deep down. So to introduce you a little bit about biomechanics before we get into lionfish and my previous lionfish research, um, let's start out with what we can learn from nature. So we've learned some really cool things about um, nature and how things like clingfish on the left here and manta rays on the right here um, succeed in their environment. So on the left, clingfish have these suction cups that are modified pelvic fins and they cling on to rocks in the rocky intertidal and they cling on to substances that are very slippery and rough. So researchers have been looking at how they are basically have a no fail suction cup, which is pretty interesting, right? Because if you've ever tried to um, have a suction cup in your shower, a lot of the times it doesn't work. So fish like clingfish can do it better. And also on the right here, we have manta rays and manta rays filter feed, and they don't get to replace their filters like in an aquarium setting, like we can do in an aquarium or a fish tank. Um, but they have filters and they feed throughout their lifetime using their filters and they have a no clogging mechanism and current research has looked at um, pretty much how they feed without clogging their filters. So these are just a few current things that are in relation to biomechanics and what we can learn if we look at organisms. And so I'm really interested in defensive or protective structures like the lionfish um, spines. And there's been some current research on protective structures, but before I got started, really not um, on lionfish. So for example, we've looked at porcupine quills and some porcupine quills have these backward facing barbs here, and those help puncture the predator or the material better. 
We've also learned a lot about sea urchin spines in nature. So sea urchin spines are very strong and stiff. And if you zoom in, you can see this really intricate porous structure that sort of looks like human bone. And from the inspiration of looking at sea urchin spine design, researchers have developed better bone grafting material and cement that's actually less fracture resistant, which is pretty cool. We've also learned cool things about these porcupine or puffer fishes down here um, on the left hand side. And if we look at the tips of their spines, we see that those are more likely to break off um, in case of attack. So it can save them energy in the long term from having to regrow an entire new spine. But I was, I was really interested in um, lionfish spines when I got to Florida. And we didn't really know much about lionfish spines besides they were venomous. And I wanted to know really how they worked um, in a biomechanics perspective. So how did lionfish get here? So the first lionfish occurred off the coast here in Dania Beach, which is very close to where I got my PhD at FAU uh, near West Palm Beach a little bit. And it was in 1985. And some hypothesis on how they got here was we had a um, Hurricane Andrew and some aquaria might have released um, some lionfish. Also some people that had lionfish in their homes and their home aquaria probably released them as well. And some current genetics have traced it back to maybe just six fish that really started this invasion here. And since then, looking at this graph now in 2018, or this map here, we see that lionfish are now in the Gulf of Mexico, they're down in the Caribbean, and they can go up as far north as Rhode Island during the summer months. So they have really taken over in a short amount of time. And so what are some what are some facts about lionfish that really let them be successful invaders? What do we know about them? So they grow very fast and they mature very fast for fish, right? So they can reproduce faster at a younger age. A female lionfish can lay up to 2 million eggs per year, which is really crazy when you think about it. And those eggs can float around and get carried by the ocean currents um, and go into different environments. Um, a recent study looked at the bacteria and disease resistance that they have on their skin as well, which might enable them to be um, successful invaders here. And they can consume more during their summer months, um, so more during hotter temperatures, and they can digest it faster. So this has implications for climate change as we keep warming our waters, right? Lionfish might become better and better at eating, basically. And they can also go long periods without food. So a study in the 90s showed that lionfish can go maybe about three months without eating anything and not really losing any body weight. And then um, some lionfish have been shown to be cannibalistic. So they actually can eat each other as well. So now going into looking at the spines, which I'm really interested in, right? They have spines all over their body. So they have spines on the top of their body, the dorsal spines, and then they have spines on their pelvic and anal fin down here on their lower body. And if you zoom into the spine, it's sort of not what you expect. So most people think that lionfish spines are hollow and the venom flows through the middle, but actually the venom flows through these glands here on the side and this spine is not hollow. It has this little trilobed cross-sectional area. And it has this fin sheath here, which you can also see on the picture on the right. And when you pull the fin sheath down or it hits a predator and the fin sheath gets pulled down, there's this glandular tissue here along the length of the spine that basically gets disrupted and releases the venom. And this is how the venom gets released into a predator. So this shape right here is very, very interesting to me from a mechanical perspective. Um, and I was interested in do all of these spines really function the same way in terms of defense. So again, these are the um, 13 venomous dorsal spines up on the top, and then we have these venomous pelvic and anal spines. So again, they're venomous, not poisonous. 
um, which is also a common misconception. And we can look at how they function through different tests like bending and, pun and puncture. So um, how, does, how does the spine react when we bend it, when we apply a force to it? And how does the spine react if we puncture it into a material? So how I collected my lionfish might surprise some of you, but um, so I was at a university doing research and I'm not allowed to um, do any harm to, to um, vertebrates, right? It, can, it requires an IACA protocol and all that with university research, even if lionfish are invasive, right? So I actually went to a bunch of lionfish derbies in South Florida where I got a bunch of my lionfish, um, tons and tons of, line, of lionfish for my PhD research. And the lionfish derbies are really great because they promote um, uh, sparing lionfish for, for prizes, so for money, and there's teams that are competing there. So they're pretty popular in areas like Florida now. And that is where I got the majority of my specimens for my research, which was really great because I did need a lot of lionfish spines. Okay, so how can we measure um, things or how can we look at bending and puncture, right? So I use um, a piece of engineering equipment actually right here, which you can see on the right. And if I wanted to bend the spine, I just fixed it in this um, lateral or side position here and I can apply different forces along the length of the spine and get things like how stiff the spine is and how much energy the spine can absorb, right? And then if I flip it, to the other orientation or a vertical orientation, I can basically push it through um, different materials or different um, skins from different pr predators and get the force needed to puncture. So it is some engineering and it is some math, but um, it's, it's pretty interesting to me. So the puncture material I decided to look at is there is, um, in their native habitats, groupers, bigger fish like groupers and sharks usually consume um, lionfish. And there are some groupers and sharks that sometimes consume lionfish occasionally um, in regions like South Florida. So I got some grouper skin and some black tip shark skin um, locally from Florida. And then I really looked at the skin um, morphology or the skin structure. So as you can see here on the left, if you zoom into different regions of the mouth here of the shark of the black tip shark, you can see these little structures called dermal denticles, right? And they're kind of like armor for the shark. Whereas if you look at the grouper on the right, the skin's a little bit more boring. It just looks like slimy, smooth skin, right? So, so the material is going to affect how the spine interacts with it as, as well. So looking at my results, what did I find out when I basically bent a bunch of lionfish spines and I punctured them into grouper and shark skin? So um, I found out that these dorsal spines here up on the top were less stiff and they didn't absorb a lot of elastic energy. Um, and then looking at the bottom spines here on the fish, the pelvic and the anal spines, the pelvic spines here in the front they were really stiffer. They were much stiffer and they resisted bending quite a bit. They had high elastic energy absorption. So they could absorb a lot of energy compared to these long intimidating dorsal spines. And then the pelvic spines here in the back, or sorry, the anal spines here in the back on the back fin, they were stiff too. They acted like the pelvic spines. They resisted bending a bit and they had high elastic energy absorption as well. So this was interesting because this was kind of the first study, um, my first question of my PhD, how do they act when a force is applied to them? And it did show that they, they did have a range in properties. They didn't all function the same way. Then looking at the puncture forces, right? Some of the puncture force data really um, went along nicely with the bending data. So up here on the top, we have the dorsal spines again, and these had low puncture forces, meaning it didn't take a lot of force to puncture um, the material. But 
there was a lot more damage and these spines would often bend at the tip here, which you can see, which goes along with the stiffness results that I, that I found previously, which is very interesting. The pelvic spines here on the bottom had intermediate puncture forces, so forces in between, but there's no damage surprisingly. So there's barely any damage that occurred when I punctured the pelvic spines into the skin. And then these back spines here had higher puncture forces, but less damage as well. So again, they had a wide range of puncture capability um, depending on the material. They could easily puncture grouper skin pretty well, but as you saw that shark skin had that armor, the dermal denticles. Right, so this really solidified that the lionfish, you know, might have different spines for different functions, just on the way that they're acting when we tested them. Right, so maybe those long dorsal spines up on the top are really used for intimidation, right? They make the, um, they make them look larger and scarier, right? And then the pelvic spines on the bottom, a lot of divers have been um, talking about how they sometimes float upside down and they cling their pelvic spines um, onto the rocks and kind of tuck themselves in and then secure them with the pelvic spine. So maybe those have to be less resistant to damage because of what they're doing with them. So why does this all matter? So I'm very interested in how things act um, from a mechanical perspective, right? Just the basic biology of lionfish. So really understanding the biology of the invader in relation to those defensive spines. Um, but really from a, from a different approach, right? We don't we don't learn about invasive species until they become invasive. There's not a lot of research done on lionfish and their native environments. So, so most of the research has been done on their invaded environments. And um, why that's interesting is invasive species really, you know, have been shown to um, uh, reduce biomass. Lionfish reduce biomass of the native fish populations where they are here in their invaded environments, right? And if we have reduced biodiversity or reduced biomass, that really um, will affect how climate change responds as well, right? And climate change might also affect invasive species in terms of where they're migrating. So recent research has shown that we might have more species migrating and becoming invasive in different areas just due to climate change. So it's really this circle effect of learning about um, one organism or the biology of one organism like an invasive species. And since I started my um, PhD, during the time I did my PhD, the lionfish actually invaded a new territory, which was pretty crazy um, to find out. So the lionfish actually invaded the Mediterranean. So they're originally from the Indo-Pacific, this Red Sea area here. Um, they're not you know, from South Florida or from the Caribbean or from the Gulf. That's why they're invasive. But during my time, they actually went up through this Suez Canal area and they invaded the Mediterranean. So they already invading new territories within a short time frame. when I was doing my uh, PhD for a few years. Um, so again, it's very interesting to research invasive um, species, but it's also interesting to research them before they become invasive in their native environment. And so, um, I'm really interested in the biomechanics of structures. And so that is why I looked at the form and function of the lionfish spines from a material perspective and how it relates to them becoming such a successful invader. And so that's a summary of my recent research and a little bit about lionfish that you may not have known before. And I'd like to thank all of my funders and the um, lab I got my PhD in with Dr. Marian Porter, the Florida Atlantic Biomechanics Lab, where a lot of this, re most of this research took place. Um, and of course, Florida Fish and Wildlife and Reef and all of the organizations that sponsored the lionfish derbies and supported my research in Florida. And with that, I'll take any questions that you that you have. I'd be happy to answer any questions um, relating to lionfish or or me or biomechanics in general.
Dr. Galloway, thank you so much. We're really excited to jump in and transition into our question and answer session. And first of all, we just really appreciate you sharing your research with us today. Uh, our first question comes from Deborah's class down in Kendall Elementary School in Miami. And they wanna know way back to the basics. Why is a lionfish named a lionfish? That's, that's a great question, right? So they kind of look like they have a projecting mane out with their long feathery um, pectoral fins that sort of wave around if you're going to look at a head on view of them. Um, in some areas, they're also called the firefish or the devil fish. Um, but that I believe is why they got that nickname lionfish. Thank you. Next, we have Tia, who I'd like to know, what allows the lionfish to go so long without food? That's a really great question. Um, so they didn't look at that when they looked at that study back in the 90s. Um, uh, that was a, a earlier study, um, but they do have this kind of weird digestion where they can ramp ramp it up and slow it down. So, and they can expand their stomachs really, really big. So um, maybe they can store food for a long time. So sharks go periods of time without eating as well. Um, so that's just kind of one fun fact about, about lionfish. Great. Thank you. Uh, our next two questions sort of go hand in hand. First one is, what is the difference between venomous and poisonous? Uh, and the second question is, um, are there other poisonous parts of the lionfish besides the spine? Yes. So venomous versus poisonous. Great question. So venomous means it has to be injected into you, right? So like the lionfish, it kind of stabs into something and it injects the venom, right? So that's venomous. Poisonous, it's, um, you can think of ingested, like you, like you eat it and it affects you. Um, and yes, so they have three spine regions and those are all venomous. There's no other part of the fish that is venomous. So that's why you can actually eat lionfish. Um, it's pretty good actually. And they promote that down in um, Florida uh, regions. Uh, next up, how often do lionfish breed and what is their gestation like? They breed very fast. So every few days um, was an estimate. Um, every few days, so 2 million eggs per year. Um, and it's rather fast. So nobody's really looked at the, um, the specific larval phases of the lionfish, but I'm, they do develop very fast um, because they can start reproducing at a very young age or a smaller length compared to most fishes. Uh, Marion Ortiz's class is writing in and they're curious if a spine gets into your body, will all the venom keep coming into your body? What do you do in that case? So, so yeah, you're recommended to, well, if you're diving to get out of the water because it can cause shortness of breath and issues with, with breathing, but to, um, um, to really kind of just remain calm, the venom is known to affect people differently. Um, uh, so it just depends how much venom gets into the wound, right? So, um, that sheath has to be pulled back. The venom has, the glandular tissue has to be disrupted and then the venom comes in. So as long as you remove the spine or the fish sticking into your arm or whatever it is rather fast, you know, the venom will stop being, um, put into your, put into your wound. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as you're doing your research, as you're performing your studies, have you noticed the lionfish evolving at all with all of the places they are invading? That's a very, that's a very good question. So I did do a side project with my undergraduate, one of my undergraduate students, and we looked at all of their, they have these little head spines that you can actually see here in this cleared insane lionfish on the questions page. And we wanted to look at the head spines and if there's any differences between males and females and some of those questions with, with their facial features. And while we were doing that, we actually found fish that had caudal spines, so spines on their caudal fin, but they didn't have any venom grooves or glands. So this brings up a really good um, a biological question about things like phenotypic ratio when we have an invaded um, predator and they're in new habitats and they kind of can um, diversify their phenotype or certain features. So um, that was the first time that we saw that and we published that in a paper too um, 
basically pointing out those caudal spines on those on those caudal fins. Um, so they didn't have any venom, but they still would, you know, poke you if spear fishermen caught them. So um, they probably are evolving um, different different features like that. Thank you. Uh, Byron, who is a high school marine science student in Orlando, Florida, wants to know, how are scientists trying to control lionfish populations in Florida? So there's a huge initiative right now of um, humans being the predators. So there's a be the predator campaign. Um, so those lionfish derbies that you can get um, money and rewards for being part of a team and going out and sparing lionfish and removing them from the population. Um, also, a lot of vendors sell lionfish to eat in Florida, and they're trying to expand that into other states. For example, Whole Foods sells a lionfish at the grocery store. Um, so you can eat um, lionfish. Um, and that is a way to support um, this removal of the invasive species. Thank you. Uh, Anne is just curious, how many years do lionfish typically live? That's a really, really good question. So I don't think anybody has done any otolith work. So the little, you know, um, bony part that scientists look at to age um, fish, I don't think they have done any otolith work um, and aged any lionfish, but I think the biggest one that was caught was 16 or 18 inches in length in Florida. So it was rather large. Um, nobody really knows, I don't think, in their invaded areas. Maybe there's more information on that in their native. Um, but the kind of the big priority now is to remove, um, remove them since they do reproduce so fast. Sure, thank you. Uh, Yesenia's class wants to know, how do lionfish spread so fast in your opinion? So I think it's really a combination of that they, um, they do produce so many eggs per year, um, which can float in with the ocean currents and get into other oceans, right? And then also that they're generalist feeders. So they really feed on any little, anything that they can fit in their, in their mouth and they suction feed. So they feed really fast, they expand their oral cavity and they suck in their food. So they eat things like larval fishes, um, you know, shrimp. Um, and so they're generalist feeders um, and they do reproduce really fast um, and they aren't really intimidated by anything in their invaded habitat. So I think it's a combination of factors. Sure, thank you. Cheryl asks, at this point, is it realistic to think that we can get ahead of the increase in lionfish population or are we simply just trying to slow down their population growth the best that we can? That's a great question. And I, I think it's the latter. So unfortunately, lionfish are um, here to stay um, in areas that they're pretty much established, like the Gulf and, you know, um, the Atlantic Ocean, the East Coast of Florida, you know, the Caribbean, I think they're really here to stay. So, um, you know, with invasive species, you're looking at population dynamics and, you know, will that plateau eventually? And so there's current research going on looking at, at those trends. But yeah, I think we're just trying to kind of um, dampen their growth at, the, at this point. Uh, Tia is curious, do dorsal spines and anal spines show a difference in type of material they are made of? Would the lionfish need a high calcium diet to maintain those spines? Those are so, uh, those are great questions. So, um, so they are kind of generalized, generally mineralized collagen, all of, of the spines, but nobody has done um, any histology looking at the breakdown of each of the spine regions, um, which was one of the questions I had during my PhD too, but I couldn't answer everything, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but that's a great question. And um, they are mineralized collagen, but I also was interesting in, interested in how much uh, mineralization or how mineralized the spines were in each region. So if the dorsal spines were less mineralized than the pelvic spines um, and so on. So that would be a really great question, but a lot of fishes have um, spinous structures, right? So it's very, it's very common in the fish world. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, next we have Miss Ortiz's class from Miami Springs uh, who wanna know, is there any way they might be able to get a lionfish to dissect and help with citizen science projects? Yeah, so I'm actually working um, 
with an initiative in Florida that is trying to ship lionfish to classrooms for dissection. So um, uh, it's not kind of, it hasn't really started yet, but um, I have contacts. So if you, if you'd like to email me, my email address is here on the bottom and I'd be happy to um, try to get you some lionfish to dissect. Uh, thank you so much. What a cool opportunity for those students. Um, Stephanie's, who is a high school marine science student in Orlando, Florida, is asking, what do lionfish eat in their native habitat and what do lionfish eat here in Florida? That's a great, that's another great question. So they're kind of assumed to be generalist feeders in both habitats. Um, I think there was one study here that showed that the majority um, was shrimp in, in a sample of lionfish that they got, um, but they do eat a lot of larval fishes that are important for the economy here, like um, snapper and grouper. Um, so, you know, tourism is, is um, tourism might be damaged because of that and fishing tourism specifically um, because of the lionfish impact, but they're, they're assumed to be generalist feeders and, and both are native and invasive populations, pretty much whatever fish they can fit in their mouth. <laughs> Thank you. And we probably have time for just a few more questions, just so that you know. Uh, our next one comes from Joe who asks, or, or mentions, you discuss the migration of lionfish from the Red Sea to Cyprus and the Southern part of Italy. How have they arrived in South Florida and are they now in the Singer Island and Palm Beach coast? Yes, so um, they're really up there right now. They're really along the whole East Coast. So, you know, down, you know, down to the Keys all the way up. Um, they've been found in Rhode Island um, in the summer months. So all along the East Coast. And so a few hypotheses of how they got um, uh, to the Atlantic, the East, you know, the East Coast um, is that hurricane that um, aquariums might have released a few lionfish during that hurricane or they got out by accident or a few homeowners that had home aquaria release lionfish um, when they got tired of taking care of them, which is a common problem with invasive species. Um, so those are some, those are some hypotheses about how they got here, but they've tracked it down to just about genetically speaking about six probably that started the invasion, but then the invasion got su supplemented with further, um, further introducing lionfish from home aquaria. A lot of people um, get rid of their um, fishes <laughs> that way, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, Austin writes in from Dr. Manuel C. Barado Elementary School and asks, why is the bottom spine strong and the top spine weak? So yeah, so some of my um, hypothesis is about that is that, um, you know, their dorsal spines are really long and they're a little bit thinner. And so maybe they're used for intimidation to make themselves look bigger or to increase the gape, um, the distance in the mouth that the predator would need to have to consume the lionfish. Um, so that predator prey interaction. And then the bottom spines, the pelvic and anal spines are next to important structures to like their swim bladder um, and things like that, that are important. So, um, and also they kind of sit upside down sometimes, tuck themselves upside down and tuck their pelvic fins into the rock and cling on. So maybe they're using them more in a more functional way than just intimidation. Just that really fascinating. Uh, Miguel is curious, can lionfish survive in swamps, rivers, and brackish or fresh water? That's a really great question. So there was a couple, um, I think there was a study done in Florida, actually, that looked at the salinity tolerance of lionfish, and it showed that they can live in brackish water, and they do have um, uh, they do have a range of salinities that they can actually survive in. So unfortunately, they can probably move into things like estuaries, um, wh where we have a lot of larval fishes. And, you know, so, so there is some possibility there of them moving into brackish water and them invading those areas. And we're going to wrap up this morning with one more question from Ms. Sandoya's fifth grade class who would like to know if you need a special license or permit to hunt lionfish in Florida. 
So you actually don't because they're invasive. So you can go um, and hunt lionfish and you need to spear them though, because they won't come to hook and line. So you can go and dive and spear them and you can catch as many as you want because they're invasive. So you don't need a permit. And they actually started allowing you to catch um, one more lobster during the lobster take season in Florida. Um, if you got lionfish, they started that initiative. I don't know if they're doing that anymore, but that was an initiative to kind of get more people to spear lionfish was to get some more lobster too. So you don't need a permit or anything to get lionfish. Well, thank you so much for such an interesting presentation. It was really amazing and an uh, excellent conversation. I've really enjoyed chatting with you. At this point, I'm gonna turn things over to Stephanie who's gonna wrap up this afternoon's presentation. Thank you again. Thanks, Brian. And thank you so much, Dr. Galloway. Um, the questions keep coming in and I feel so badly because there's so many of you out there that have more questions. And I would ask if you wouldn't mind um, dropping in her email in the chat box as well as ours and we'll be happy to get those questions out. Uh, also a reminder, we wanna not only thank you all for joining us today and thank you Dr. Galloway for sharing such amazing information, uh, what's happening in our waterways here in Florida with this invasive species. If you would like to take a look at the K-12 Extension activities and resources we've curated to go along with this information today, you can find that along with a recording of today's event on our YouTube channel, which is at UF Earth Systems. Um, and the other thing we would ask of you is to take a look at the survey you see here. It's also being placed in the chat box as we speak. Teachers, if you'll take a quick moment to fill out this survey and let us know what you thought of today's presentation, we would certainly be grateful for that. Also, if you would like to follow um, Anjari Foundation or Scientists in Every Florida School, we urge you to visit our websites here seen on the screen as well as follow us on social media. We hope you've enjoyed today's presentation. I know I have and I've learned so much. So we look forward to offering, offering you more of these presentations in the fall. Until later, we'll see you next time. Everyone have a great day. Bye-bye.